Good afternoon. I'm Sharona Hoffman, Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Law School. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual Rush McKnight Labor Law Lecture. In 1997, the law firm of Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, and Richard Kuzik, Charles Emmerich, Jr., and Joseph Sullivan created the lecture to honor retired partner Rush McKnight. A distinguished 1955 graduate of our law school, Rush McKnight headed Calfee, Halter, and Griswold's labor law and employee relations practice and executive committee for many years. Rush McKnight is both a civic leader in the Cleveland community and a dedicated supporter of our law school. We are proud to host this lecture in his honor and sincerely thank the members of Calfee, Halter, and Griswold and the other donors who made this lectureship possible. The Rush McKnight Lecture is presented under the umbrella of the Law School Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Conflict and Dispute Resolution, affectionately known as SISTER. It is director, directed by Professor Calvin Sharp, and its associate director is Professor Kathy Hessler. The law school created SISTER in 2005 with a mission to foster scholarship that will bring about greater understanding of traditional and innovative methods of conflict resolution and to provide our students with the skills necessary to play their many roles as lawyers. We are honored to have as our Rush McKnight speaker this afternoon, Professor Matthew Finken. He is the Albert J. Harno and Edward W. Cleary Chair in Law at the University of Illinois. He teaches courses in labor and employment law and directs the College of Law's program in comparative labor and employment law and policy. He has taught in several other law schools, including Duke and the University of Michigan. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and received the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation's Research Award for internationally acknowledged achievement in the field of labor law. Professor Finken is the author, editor, or co-editor of eight books, including the leading basic text on labor law written with Robert A. Gorman. He has also written numerous articles in labor and employment law, higher education law, and comparative law. Professor Finken has held many important editorial positions and has lectured widely in the United States, Asia, and Europe. He is active as a labor arbitrator and is a member of the governing board of the Institute for Labor Law and Labor Relations in the European community. And he has many, many other achievements, but in the interest of time, I will turn it over to Professor Fink. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored, indeed, uh, deeply honored to be asked to give this, uh, the, deliver these remarks. Uh, when Calvin Sharp called me up and uh, uh, suggested that I do so, he gave me the list of my predecessors who stood at this podium, and I am uh, uh, humbled to be, uh, to be thought uh, in that number. Uh, I started to give uh, thought to what it is that might be of interest to a law school uh, community. Uh, one turns naturally to the work that one has in progress. And I thought that perhaps I might address what I think is wrong with the proposed restatement of employment law that the American Law Institute is misbegottenly pursuing. Uh, I thought perhaps I could have a bash at what the National Labor Relations Board has been doing to the, to the Labor Act. Uh, or perhaps invite you to think about the responses of the law in the UK, France, and Germany to the, the uh, American approach to uh, the privatization of law via employer-sponsored arbitration systems. But then Calvin told me that the lecture was one for which continuing legal education credit was given. And I was dubious that it was credit worthy to subject members of the bar to my idiosyncratic thoughts that bore so little resemblance to the real world. So I turned to something else, uh, a problem that bedeviled me uh, six years ago and as well 
uh, Professor Kenneth Dauschmidt of Indiana University, who's a law and economics of Maven, uh, has both a law degree and a PhD in economics from Michigan. We've both been puzzled by uh, the reference problem. And we each independently arrived at pieces of a solution, which for this afternoon I thought I might spot weld. Uh, I'm speaking only for myself, not for uh, Ken Dauschmidt, I sent him a copy of my full manuscript, and all I got was a cryptic email saying that there was so much wrong with it that he didn't, he didn't have time to, uh, to give me extensive uh, comments. Uh, what's the problem? In 1991, Ramona Petzold and Steve Wilborn, the dean of the law school at Nebraska, University of Nebraska, published, I think, a very thoughtful and provocative article in which they pointed out that American employers had begun to cease, if not significantly ceased altogether, to provide references on prior employees. They declined to do so out of fear of lawsuits for defamation. And they called this, the article was entitled The Irrationality of the Employer Response, because they went back and looked at the incidence uh, of lawsuits, the number of lawsuits filed in the previous generation, in the 60s, and the rate of success, and found absolutely no difference between the 60s and the 80s. Uh, and yet, and so they argued that employers were overreacting, perhaps to the advice of counsel, on the advice of counsel, perhaps to accounts in the popular press of, mad, of, of large uh, damage awards, which uh, almost invariably get reduced on remittiture, which reductions are never uh, covered in the press. Um, in other words, there was a, a kind of market uh, failure and that this was, um, had deleterious consequences. It resulted in uh, a mismatching of employees with jobs, of, of undue churning in the labor market and of, of scarring. Of, of, People were promising employees were unable to manifest their demonstrable promise on the basis of their records, and unpromising employees could hide because the want of forthcomingness of information. Indeed, the Society for Human Resource Management indicated in its last survey that the human resource managers surveyed indicated that fully 40 percent of the resumes they received were uh, misrepresented the applicant's uh, credentials or experience. Uh, at the time they wrote, only one state had legislated with regard to this problem, that's Florida. Um, a trickle of legislation followed, and then in 94, 95, and 96, there was a wave of legislation. Fully, I think, half the states have now enacted laws to deal with the reference problem, to encourage employers to be more forthcoming. I'll put the Kansas statute aside for the moment. These laws, Ohio is one. These laws all bristle with technical complexities that have, the courts have yet to address. But they proceed upon a, a single assumption that if we massage the qualified privilege that otherwise applies in defamation to references, uh, employers will be more forthcoming in, in giving them. And I will describe the state of the law momentarily. Uh, that approach has not succeeded, uh, at least according to the data that I've been able to collect. 1998, remember the, this wave of, of, of legislation sort of crested around 96. 1998, the Society for Human Resource Management survey indicated that less than 1% of employers surveyed refused to give dates uh, the, refused to confirm that the employee, the applicant, had been employed in the dates of employment. In other words, most employers would say, yes, he worked for us, and these were his dates. In 2004, 53% of employers will not confirm that the individual ever worked for them or the dates that the individual did so. 28% uh, of employers in 1998 uh, would address the question of whether the employee was eligible for rehire. Only 64% would in 2004. And I can go down these statistics. Uh, um, 
39 percent would give the statement of reasons why the candidate left, uh, would refuse, rather, to give that statement today or as of 2004, 71 percent would refuse to do that. In other words, the information stream um, has basically shut down. And from an economic point of view, this is uh, it's a bad thing uh, for reasons that I've indicated. Uh, well, what can we do about it? The, the, let me address this, the law, and then I'll come back to, I think, other alternatives. The law of defamation, I think most of you are familiar with the law of defamation. Defamation is a, is a misrepresentation of fact um, that injures a person in that person's trade profession or ability to pursue a trade or profession. Highly technical body of law it goes back to English or British law of uh, centuries ago, so you have all kinds of distinctions of, li of, of, of libel per se, or uh, if it's a written word, libel per se, libel per quad, when you have to prove damages the uh, innocent construction rule, and on and on and on. But I, I, there's no reason to, to belabor that. The point is um, the law is concerned here with false negatives. Nevertheless, the fact the law recognizes that there are social circumstances where we must tolerate some falsehood, some injurious falsehood. It is better that the nature of the, that the communication be made and that the occasional victims suffer than that we should shut off the communication, that the communication stream should be shut off at all. So certain kinds of communications are privileged, and privileges may be either absolute, which speaks for itself, or qualified. Qualified privilege extends to a communication made in the pursuance of a common interest, so long as the words used are not excessive. And it is universally held, I think, that an, a reference from a prior employer to a prospective one is qualifiedly privileged. The Connecticut Supreme Court just held so last year, stating it's a case of first impression. I was just flummoxed. I would have thought that Connecticut by now would long have addressed, have addressed that issue. Um, what would defeat a qualified privilege is a showing of malice. Now, malice can mean actual malice, which is ill will or hatred. You lied because you wanted to injure the, uh, the, the target. Or it can have, uh, it can have, it can mean uh, legal malice or constitutional or constitutional malice, which, which is knowledge of falsity or reckless or wanton disregard of the truth or falsity, and that is not a negligence standard. It must mean that the speaker had reason to believe that the words were false at the time the speaker uttered it. Uh, what these statutes do almost uniformly is say that a communication, a reference made on a prior employee to a prospective employer is made in good faith, which in other words is a presumption that it is made in good faith. The burden rests upon the plaintiff, therefore, to negative the privilege extended, which is the same as qualified privilege. The Rhode Island Supreme Court says essentially all this does is codify the common law. Um, the plaintiff has to negative the qualified privilege by showing malice. And in most jurisdictions, what they mean, some jurisdictions are explicit, we mean actual malice, but most jurisdictions say uh, knowledge of falsity or reckless or wanton disregard. That is to say, you had reason to believe the words were false at the time at the time you uttered them. Uh, that is what these statutes do, and it has proven, they have proven insufficient as a means of encouraging employers to be more forthcoming with candid assessments uh, of the experience that they've had with uh, former employees. There is a problem that is not addressed in the law of defamation, and that's not the false negative, but the false positive. Uh, my favorite case is an Illinois case where uh, a, it's a sort of ripped off the headlines. It has to do with a trader um, who uh, applied for a job with a German company, and the German company demanded a reference. We can get into the German law of references uh, if, if time allows, because it, there is a mandatory reference law. It's an interesting case. But the German company demands a reference, and the prior employer says, oh, this commodities trader was a woman upstanding, righteous, you know, competent, wonderful, two-sentence uh, encomium to a man who had been disbarred by the Commodities Future Trading Commission from trading in his own account, from trading in any account in which he had an interest, and from trading as a signatory trader with them at all. 
And the German company hires him on the strength of that recommendation, and he pursues to do what, uh, on a very small scale, what Monsieur Kaviel has done with the Société Générale, uh, and loses several million dollars, whereupon the uh, Neptuno, the German company, sues the prior employer for having misled him. Illinois Court of Appeal said that there is no duty owed between the provider of the reference to the recipient of the reference, and therefore there can be no liability. Uh, Michigan, I think, takes the same approach. Uh, New Mexico does not. California does not, at least where the employee poses a risk of physical harm or injury. Um, Colorado does not. I mean, it would allow liability in a, in a very similar case of a defalcating bookkeeper who's praised. Um, and the state of Washington, I think, accepts the New Mexico view that there is a duty to disclose where there's a risk of physical harm, but in the particular case, and we may care to discuss it, it held that there was no duty to disclose under the facts of that, of that case. So our law on, posit on false positives is rather at six and sevens. We, there really is no common, there is no American rule yet, no common rule um, on how to deal with that problem. And the question of whether it ought to be addressed in statute is one I'll, I hope to hear when we open this up for discussion. Well, if we have a problem, and I think we do, and if the law that has been devised to redress it isn't working, and I think it has, isn't, hasn't been working, well, then what are the alternatives? One alternative that's been recommended in the literature is counseling. That is to say, employers ought to be educated to their irrationality. Uh, there's an article in the New York Times that said that employers are more forthcoming now. They understand. Do you understand what we have in part of the problem? To put it, part of the problem in economic terms is a coordination problem. I give a reference on an employee to you. You get the benefit of having this information, transparency in the labor market, and I can be sued. I get no benefit of providing you the information. You get the benefit. The cost all lies on me. That's a coordination problem. Uh, true, the likelihood of my being sued successfully is quite small. The uh, 2004 SHRM survey indicates that 2% of human resource managers, uh, of the resource manager, human resource managers surveyed, only 2 well, I don't want to say only because I don't know what the metric is, 2% say they have been sued for defamation over once, at least once over the past three years. Uh, given the uh, presence of a qualified privilege and the high burden it places to overcome, that is say, knowledge of falsity or reckless wanton disregard, I take it the real op concern of employers is not so much the, the losing a successful suit as the need to hire a lawyer and make a motion for summary judgment at all. I say just, if I don't give a reference, I never have to be in court at all. So one remedy to this has been suggested is counseling. Educate employers that if it's to their benefit to give these references. The New York Times the uh, business section said that's happening. I've yet to see the statistics. There's a lag, but I've yet to see. The no statistics were cited in that, in that article, and there are no more recent surveyed statistics to the best of my knowledge. Second response, certainly for those who are law and economics mavens in the academy, would be, would be uh, let the market solve the problem. The market would solve the coordination problem. I get a reference from you if you get a, me your references. We could have a sort of market mechanism. The problem with that is that the problem is being law-driven. Yes, there's a coordination problem, but it arises in a, in a context or matrix of the prospect of litigation, if not liability, and a market mechanism won't solve that problem. A third possibility is why not accord an absolute privilege? Uh, you can't be sued. Can we do that? Well, obviously, not only can we have the the Kansas statute does accord an absolute privilege for the disclosure of certain information contained, or unredacted information contained, in an employee's personnel file, which is turned over at the written request of a prior of a prospective employer. Um, the New York Court of Appeals, New York's highest court. Uh, just last year, and that's only a few months ago, in Rosenberg, and I'll give, since this, you are getting CLE credit, I will give citations. Rosenberg versus MetLife, 866 Northeast 2nd, 439. The New York Court of Appeals held that the form, the U5 form, 
which is a form that a securities brokerage must file under the rules of the various stock exchanges whenever a broker quits or is dismissed, giving the reasons for the quit or discharge. And that form is actually, I think it's available on the web. It's certainly publicly available. In picking a broker, you can check the U5 form. Uh, that that form is absolutely privileged under New York law over very strong dissent. So we could accord it absolute privilege. The question is whether that's too harsh a remedy because what it means if, is that information that is disclosed recklessly, intentionally, harmfully, with knowledge of falsity, with a, with a, with, in order to injure, gets a free ride. Uh, can that happen? Uh, well, it has. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of cases in the securities industry itself. Uh, Garlino versus Merrill Lynch, 504 Fed 3rd, 189, First Circuit, 2007. Rosenzweig versus Morgan Stanley, 494 Fed 3rd, 1328, 11th Circuit, 2007. Uh, bear with me. El Haddad versus United Arab Emirates. This is where the reasons for discharge were just fabricated. 496 Fed 3rd, 5, uh, so strike that. 496 Fed 3rd, 658, DC Circuit, 2007. So in a case where a miffed employer says to a prospective employer that the employee, the employer being miffed for no good cause, by the way, refers to the employee as, quote, a psychopathic liar and whore. Uh, if an absolute privilege extend, extended, uh, those words could be uttered uh, with impunity. So. I don't know that a strong case can be made for an absolute privilege. Another option, one discussed at great detail, uh, in great detail by J. Holt for, for Kirky at the University of Virginia, who goes by the sobriquet Rip for Kirky, um, in an article in the 1998 uh, University of Chicago Law Review, discusses the prospect of a mandatory reference law. Well, now why not have a law that says you've got to give a reference? Uh, several states had something like that, service letter statutes. They were passed at the turn of the century as a means of avoiding, as, as a means of dealing with blacklisting, particularly for union activity. Uh, only, the only one still on the books that's much, that's one sees litigated at all is Missouri's, excuse me, Missouri. Uh, and as I read the uh, Missouri jurisprudence, the Supreme Court says that the reason, you, have, you must state the reason for the quit or discharge and if the, the reason the employer gives is its reason, it need not be a true reason. That's all, it's a very strange statute. Uh, that's our only, we don't have much experience, uh, therefore, with mandatory reference law. Um, I can discuss, there, there is, as part of this workup, uh, and I, I did take a look at, uh, at I tried to look for where, where there are mandatory, are there such things mandatory reference laws? But for Kirky sets up a whole parade of horribles that if there is such a thing, it could be used as an interim device to threaten or discipline workers. I'm going to give you a bad reference if you don't shave up. Or it becomes a kind of a part of a bargain between, you know, I'll give you a good reference if, you know, you leave. Um, it can be gained by the employers, uh, he argues, uh, by just routinely giving false positives. Um, and if we are really going to litigate the basis upon which the reference is made, the transaction costs would be, would be too high, and employers really wouldn't be very forthcoming. These are all speculations. Um, actually, Germany does have mandatory reference law. It goes back to 1869, Zeugnisrecht. Uh, and I crunched the numbers, and I've looked to try to make some sense of, uh, of the German system. The Germans are very unhappy with it, but, but they love rules, and it is very rule-bound. Uh, the, the interesting question is the one of false positives. I, the, 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 your, the employee is entitled to a reference. It may be either a qualified or unqualified reference. An unqualified reference is day, job duties and date of hire. That's it. And if that's all you can present to a prospective employer, it sends a very strong signal. The qualified reference is, must state the employee's uh, uh, performance and behavior on the job. And that is litigated. In the German labor courts, the past uh, last year, in 2005, there were 30,000 notice cases litigated. 
uh, well, the, in the context, you understand, about 740,000 cases are presented a year in the German labor court system. So it rep my estimate is that it represents about 4% of all dismissals, involuntary dismissals in Germany, about 4% do the employees contest the notice. The Germans are very well aware of how the deficiencies in the system and the pros prospects of gaining it, it becomes a kind of rent-seeking rent by the employees who can impose costs on the employer by suing in the labor court because you, damages might be available if you're unable to present an accurate notice and in order to secure a job because it's expected. You, you don't have an accurate notice from the employer because he's giving you an inaccurate notice. Uh, and also the prospect of false positives. Uh, I love, you know, we all have certain experiences in life, but it's, it's odd that, I know civilizations do, but uh, certain uh, patterns of events but, or ways of thinking. But it's odd to me as someone who's worked in Germany for many years that, the, the, you know, it's, the, the, the Germans seem to have a word for it. We don't. You know, uh, uh, we all take joy in the misfortune of our enemies, but only German has a word for it, you know, Schadenfreude. Right? And indeed, in this area, there is a verb, weckloben, weck meaning away, and loben is to praise. Right? To sing someone's praises in order to get rid of them. Uh, how many appointments committees have encountered that? And this, uh, so, there are lots of problems with, I think it's true to say there are lots of problems with the mandatory reference system. Is, uh, are we now bereft? I think not. The idea that Dow Schmidt and I came up with, and I'm trying out on you, you're my experiment, um, and in a few minutes, feel free to shoot holes in it, is something like this. We like the market mechanism. We like the idea that those who put in a reference can draw a reference out. The problem is, of course, the prospect of liability. And only the state can deal with that. And absolute privilege is too strong. What if a state, Ohio, for example, were to create a reference pool, a state-run reference pool, paid out of fees of participating companies? A company who puts the reference in can get a reference back from any other participating company. Participation is voluntary. The references would be absolutely privileged by a lawsuit brought by the employee, whether for defamation or interference in prospective economic advantage. So there's the safe harbor. But what if the reference isn't accurate? I understand there are many States have access to employee records laws where if the employee thinks the personnel file is not accurate, you can put in an objection. The Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act has a similar provision. Uh, all that does, we suspect, is signal to a prospective employer that you're a dissident so-and-so. Uh, they're not going to get involved into who said what, and whether you really were a sexual harasser or it was just... So we think that a component of the system that makes sense to us is to allow the employee to challenge the reference, the accuracy of the reference, and to have a hearing on it. Swiftly, we hope, that's a soft point in the system, probably by an arbitrator selected off a pool or a roster run by the pooling agency. Labor arbitrators decide these kinds of questions all the time. They're really quite routine. The cost of an arbitration over the correction of an employee's record is, should bear scant resemblance to the cost of litigating uh, a defamation case. Um, and either the arbitrator would approve the references written, find it's within the realm, uh, or order it to be corrected. And the, a reference in the pool and drawn from the pool that is not objected to in a timely fashion by the employee, or is not correct, or, that is not objected to, or in a small number of cases we suspect is corrected pursuant to arbitral order, would be absolutely privileged. In a nutshell, that's the proposal. Now, that solves the false positive problem, and it solves the coordination problem, and it minimizes, we would like to think, it should minimize, or at least militate toward a minimization of transaction costs. It does not solve the false positive problem. Now, nor do, 
how do you, the, the proposal won't deal with an employer who games the system by saying, well, I'm going to give everybody positive references. Uh, and I'll draw out accurate references from my counterpart. By the way, you'll notice, by the, let me drop, drop a footnote, you'll notice a, a consequence of this database, all of this can be done electronically, is that a company looking for highly qualified machinists can punch in and see, get references on machinists who've left their job for whatever reason from other participating companies. It can, it can be a, a, almost a sort of sorting and, and, and uh, labor pooling mechanism, uh, which I think adds efficiency uh, to the to, uh, labor market by, by adding transparency to the labor market. Um, well, let's say th two, two and a half things to that, okay. to the problem of false positives or gaming the system. One is uh, the self-selection process. The firms that are, are into this are firms that want to be into it because they see something in it for them. Um, indeed, even in the German system, the German system in the main, despite its complexities, and we can discuss some of them, uh, the reputation of the firm giving the reference is taken into account by the receiving, by the firm looking at the reference. If that's a reference from uh, XYZ GmbH, ah, they give good reference. This is an accurate reference. So it's to the advantage of all players. Secondly, I think the labor pool organization itself has an interest in the probity of what it's doing. If it gets a significant number of complaints from participating firms that the references it got from firm ABC uh, are not, that the employees that are, are, are being praised uh, are not performing up to snuff, and that's a consistent pattern or emerges as a pattern, I think the pool would have the full, fully uh, clothed with authority to throw the company out of the pool because its references simply aren't reliable. Now, the more controversial aspect, and I haven't bounced this off of uh, Dauschmidt, does have to do more, uh, on the third, I'm sorry, the, 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 the third sort of sobering caution is the, the very uncertainty of the law of liability to third parties. The employer who gives the reference, if the reference pool says nothing about it, labors under considerable uncertainty in most jurisdictions whether there is a possibility of in, the, in my Neptuno case, should that case occur in Ohio, and I don't know what the law in Ohio is. But if there, if there were a reference pool set up in Ohio, and, you know, giving a reference on the trader saying you, he was a terrific trader without mentioning his disbarment, right, the prospect that an Ohio court might not take that too kindly in the event there's reliance on that and, and damage, uh, is a kind of sobering limit, self-limit, on, on, uh, as, it, as it actually is in Germany. There is only two cases in Germany that have allowed, by the Supreme Court in Civil Affairs, that have allowed liability for not informing a prior a prospective employer, for example, that the employee had embezzled exactly this Colorado case. <laughs> German employers don't know where the line to be drawn is, and not knowing where the line to be drawn is, you tend to be more forthcoming. I would wonder about whether it would make sense, and truly this is a, 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 a merely amusing on my part, to say that if the employer does include negative information, which is fully disclosed, and the arbitrator decides that it ought not be disclosed, whether that would not, should not afford an absolute privileges to any third party as a way of encouraging, and as a way of fairness. Now, let me give you the, the case that I mentioned, the Washington case at the beginning. We had the Mabton School District hired a custodian, good custodian, worked for some years, who was accused of child molestation. He's prosecuted for child molestation, and the DA decides to drop the charge on condition that he resign as a school custodian. The school conducts its own investigation and concludes that this was a family dispute, had nothing to do with child molestation, and they rehire him as a school bus driver. And he works in that capacity, I think, for a year and decides to move on to another district. He asks for a, a reference as a custodian. And the Mabton School District says he was a terrific custodian. We'd hire him back, but not only would we hire him back in a minute, we did. He gets hired by another school district. And the student complains that the custodian had asked the student where he lived. Files a complaint. The custodian 
uh, they research the more fully his background. They discover the prior criminal accusation. They dismiss him for falsifying his application. He didn't mention his prior criminal incident uh, in his application. He's discharged. He's unionized. He takes it to arbitration, and he wins. The arbitrator said the student who complained that Richland was his cousin. This was a family dispute. It had nothing to do with anything. He had been exonerated and performed superbly at Mapton. There was never a... Uh, uh, there was no reason for Map. There was no reason for him to disclose what the, what the Mapton district... Well, strike that. There was no reason to discharge him for not making a disclosure that was harmful to him and baseless. What was he supposed to say? Oh, I, I was dismissed on a baseless charge and then rehired in another capacity. Richland then sues Mapton. You, sh you should have told us about this incident. And the Washington Court of Appeals said Mapton was under no greater obligation to disclose to Richland what the employer or employee was under no obligation to disclose. Now, all this sorts out post hoc what should have been disclosed and under what circumstances when. Would it make sense to say that if Mabton had given a reference that says he, was, he resigned under threat of criminal prosecution, we investigated and found that we thought the, the charge baseless, we rehired him and would rehire him again. Should that be included in the letter of reference? Would it make sense to say that he could contest that as being unfair? It's accurate, but unfair. You know, they tell the story of the um, uh, captain of the ship who was uh, angry at the first mate and wrote in the log, for the first mate drunk today. And when the first mate took the watch and saw the log entry, he wrote, Captain Sober today. I would suggest it might make sense to say that as a way of encouraging employers to be more forthcoming, but there are circumstances where disclosure is accurate but unfair uh, and unnecessarily harmful, as in this Mapton richland case. To say that if an arbitrator has ordered excision of information that is disclosed, that would be, again, absolutely privileged against a suit by any third party. The subsequent employer, its clients, or the like. Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard Dauschmidt on that. I'm just, it need not. The statute may maintain a kind of agnostic silence and let the uncertainty of liability itself work as a kind of hydraulic pressure on employers to be more for Well, that's the, that's the thinking uh, Dauschmidt, uh, uh, I like to say Dauschmidt thinking, but he can take more of the blame than I. Um, I do know we have a problem, and this is one proposed solution. Louis Brandeis said that the states were the laboratories for legal experiment. Our states have experimented and the experiments failed. Does it make sense for one state, maybe mine, maybe yours, some state to experiment with a labor reference pool scheme and see if that uh, conduces toward greater transparency in the labor market? Thank you for your forbearance. I can do it. I can okay. do it. Uh, Professor Finken will take questions. He does have to leave promptly at 5.30, but we have about 20 minutes for questions. I'm going to uh, walk around with the microphone uh, for people that want to ask questions so that this can be recorded and so that everyone can hear your questions. So go ahead if you have a question. Okay. While he's walking around with the mic, I, 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 I hate to speak and run, but there's a snowstorm fast approaching Chicago and my hometown, and I don't know that I'm going to get home tonight, so we will see. Yes, sir. Yes, have you um, considered a standardized form for each of the um, particular occupations? That would be yeah, I think that's a wonderful, yes, that's a wonderful question. The, the, the human resource uh, uh, surveys, in fact, as, and I began to go down that list of questions. Would you hire? Were there any incidents of violence? Were there, you know, the, I think the reference pool would be privileged, would in, be encouraged to work with unions, employers, 
other interested parties and organizations to develop a standard form, not saying that there might not be other areas for comment and, and idiosyncratic, but I think a standard set of questions, and indeed most, I think most human resource managers do in fact have a sort of standard set of questions they want to answer. Like would you rehire, and if not, why not? Yeah. Good. Well, that, that is, I mean, uh, how much, you tell me, I mean, how much does it cost for a company to uh, uh, retain counsel as a mo uh, and, and make a motion for summary judgment? I mean, uh, it's billable hours, I mean, uh, you know, or time. In terms of a, an arbitration, you've got to be sure there's preparation time and probably about a half a day of hearing time. According to FMCS figures, uh, the average dismissal case, dismissal from employment, is a lot weightier than you know, an assessment. In a, the arbitra arbitrator's fee is about $3,500. That's the national f average figure. It's higher in the West Coast, East Coast, a little, I'm sorry to say, lower in the Midwest. Um, I cannot help believe, but believe that it's a lot cheaper to go in before an arbitrator and lay the file out and say this is what we concluded than, than, than litigating about it with all the technicalities of, of, of defamation or tortious interference uh, with prospective economic advantages. But so the, those costs, I think the costs, the costs are, I, I suspect the costs really do weigh in favor of this proposal. Are there any other questions? I think the, the, there, are, there should be a modest filing fee for the employee. And of course, the employee is going to have to find counsel if he, uh, is, he or she is really serious about this. I think the cost of the system are internalized to the users of the system, i.e., I think the, the company should pay, should pay the cost of the system. Um, if if uh, these SHRM figures are correct, we're talking about maybe 2% of the references given would be challenged. There would obviously be a period of negotiation, if not settlement over the terms of what the reference would say. I don't know that, I don't, is that a, so we, we, we've got a market, we've created a market, we've given an absolute privilege to the news store, now we have a pricing problem. Huh? Uh, too, high, too, too high, too low, just right? Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, that we, we're, but I think I think we would and we could set it up on an experimental basis and see what the cost, you know initial startup costs from the state, and the system eventually should pay for itself out of employer fees. If if the employers, if if a single employer, I dare say, finds itself subjected more frequently than its uh, counterparts to claims that its references aren't accurate, uh, that might tell us something about that employer. Any other questions? I'm going to catch her down here real quick. If when you're asking a question in the microphone, if you could hold the microphone close enough to your mouth so that it can pick up your voice. I think we're being webcast, which is why it's important to actually pick up everything on the microphone. But I was just wondering if it's actually really true that employers do not give any references if their stated policy is just a date of hire and date of uh, termination. Uh, a company that has an employee who leaves who's a vice president, for example, is there really no way for other employers to find out anything about performance? You would think employers would rebel against that kind of system where they just couldn't get information. Well, two things. They, let's take, um, uh, you know, CEOs and out of this mix for a moment. Um, there's increasing resort to background checking companies. So, which is a cost, and I think a cost that our proposal would uh, militate toward, toward lessening. I mean, yes, they want that information. They can't get it from the employer directly. Uh, they hire background checking companies to check on what, what, what you can check on that way, criminal records and this sort of thing, or you pick up a phone. But 
picking up the phone won't help because uh, the, now you've got, it's still a law of defamation, except it's, it's slander, which is spoken defamation, and not liable. What employees do when they think that they're being bad mouthed because every time they get close to a job, it gets cold, they hire com companies to pose as prospective employers making phone calls and saying, what can you tell me about uh, Mr. Jones? And, uh, now, one court has held that, that, that that's consent, that the defense of consent applies, and, and that's just plain as a legal matter wrong. You could, you cons consent means that you know that the nature of the defamation that's going to be uttered. If you don't know at all, you can't have consented to it. And indeed, there are companies, there's a market for everything. This is a capitalist society. You know, companies in the business of, of, of posing as prospective employers and get, trying to get this information, which, which simply ratchets up the prospect of, of liability. I do think that human resource managers try very, very hard to tell supervisors and coworkers, if you get a call, refer them to human resources. Do not answer that, that inquiry. How often is it actually honored? You know, I don't know, but every time it's not honored, the company has opened itself up to liability. Your proposed solution of an experiment in one state, how does that work with the market now where employees move state to state? So if Ohio has this and somebody wants to work in Walmart in California, Walmart has stores everywhere. They're part of this group in Ohio. They use that in their hiring decision in California. They're still open to a lawsuit there. Well, then you have choice of law problem. I mean, Walmart's participating in the pool in, in Ohio, right, for a hiring decision made for, to assign someone to California, right? It's got to be a participant in the pool. Two companies both have to be participants in the pool, right? Right. Okay. So, yeah, you've got – we haven't I, we haven't really – picked up on that because it's a choice of law problem. Widow, it's possible, uh, it is, I, I know my, one of my, my colleagues, um, Larry Ribstein, who's written about the choice of law clauses in contracts, would see no obstacle at all to uh, a company saying that you will agree as a condition of employment to this reference. We haven't talked about whether it ought to be consensual by the employee's part, by the way, uh, which, um, but that, you know, a choice of law clause saying, saying this is governed by Ohio law. Uh, I think he would think that that would, that would do the trick. And he's written, a, a, I think, an award-winning article on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about choice of law, you know, employer boilerplate, as many of you know, know from the stuff I've, I've done. But so I've got to really think about that. It's, a, it's a, certainly a very strong reservation about single state op operation. But again, these reference laws are state by state. So the same problem would arise vis-a-vis -vis a state that did not legislate the goodwill, you know, hiring someone from, who gets a reference from Kansas, let's say. Any other questions? Maybe it's too simplistic. Your idea is great, but I can see John Smith at Company A calling uh, Mr. Jones at Company B and saying, watch out for this guy. And a conversation never took place. It happens every day. The conversations never took place. Because I run into it in my area of practice. We never called them. We never said this. It never happened. And you can have all the people out there that do this test calling. I don't think you really want to say that in public. <laughs> They're being recorded. <laughs> I do debtor creditor work. And when I call a collection agent, said, my client said to me that you threatened her with garnishment. Well, we never did never that. We that. never said that. It never happened. And that's what you run into day in, day out. And I think you're going to have the same problem here. Sure. I mean, we are expecting, uh, how would I put it, the amount of probity and the amount of good. Uh, the same question that was raised about what if they call a coworker uh, or a former foreman and says, what can you, what can you tell us about it? And, and the company says, don't answer that, but, but, but people like to talk. Uh, you know, what can the law do? This law won't address that. The law of de it's still covered by the law of defamation, right? Only a, only a reference vetted through this system would be absolute liability. So the company's always at risk that the that the caller is 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 acting on at the behest of the uh, of the individual or somehow blabs or confesses or you know the company's at risk for that. And we our plan is devised to try to minimize that risk. Thank you. 
by channeling it into the system. Well, thank you all very, very much for your forbearance, and I hope to, you, to hear from you individually. My email is, you know, University of Illinois Law School, if you have any ideas about this, because it is a first effort to try to come to grips with a problem that obviously we're not solving very well. Thank you very much. Thank you.